Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Monday, September 26th, 2022, and today we are going to be talking about the three major pathways for the Republican Party to reach the Senate majority these midterm elections. Now, as of right now, there are very many competitive states on the governor level, Senate level, and many competitive House districts. But as we get closer to November, we start to realize that some states have become increasingly more out of reach for both sides of the aisle. For instance, states such as North Carolina, which have gotten closer in more recent time frame, uh, are still very much out of reach for the Democratic Party, looking at the lack of competitive nature within the state. Uh, yes, it is going to be close, but it is not going to go to the Democratic Party, and under different circumstances with a different nominee, it might have gone towards the Democrats. Looking at the flip side of it, we have states such as New Hampshire and Colorado, states that were initial early targets for the GOP that are simply not there for consideration, largely because now they are out of reach, and the Republican Party recognizes that. What we are going to be doing is exploring the ways that both sides of the aisle, more so on the Republican side, because that's the point of this video, but both sides of the aisle hold up in each of these races and how different victories can lead to different outcomes in the overall uh, outcome of the Senate majority, meaning Republicans, Democrats, and uh, you know everyone else dealing with each party being in power, uh, but primarily focused on the Republican Party's chances at victories here. But we will talk briefly about how Democrats can hold on to some of these seats, even if others may flip in the opposite direction, meaning Democrats could make up for some losses, but generally speaking, we're not going to be too heavily focused on that. So on our map right now, what you have is our current composition of the U.S. Senate. We have Republicans in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. We have Democrats in Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, and Colorado, and New Hampshire. Right now, the Republican Party is really only seeing their states of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina become competitive. There is consideration, too, that Ohio and Florida might join the bunch by the time we reach November. Ohio seems to be there in terms of polling data, but in terms of what we actually expect, we still very much think the Republican Party is going to come out ahead there by a lean margin, no longer likely, but still a victory regardless. Florida, on the other hand, we really haven't moved out of the likely column, though there are some polls in the state that are indicating a close and competitive race. Realistically, Mark Rubio is on track for re-election, but then again, I could be off this November, and so could many Republicans and Democrats who have written off this race entirely. But keeping it there for some level of possibility but probably won't be a focus for Democrats for this cycle. As for the Democrats in terms of their competitive states, you have New Hampshire, you have Georgia, you have Colorado, Arizona, and Nevada. There was some consideration that Republicans might try to target the state of Washington. Realistically, we aren't going to see that happen. Some polls out of the state today said it was competitive. I don't buy it. I don't buy it in the slightest. I do not expect Wisconsin, uh, sorry, Washington to be a competitive state this November, and I don't think that you should either. But we'll keep it there just for the sake of keeping Florida in the likely column, keeping Washington there. So these are the states where you're really starting to see the Republican Party and the Democratic Party really fight for the overall Senate control. Right now, as a 50-50 Senate map, it becomes very easy to see how the Republicans do win control, especially knowing previous midterm years. 2010, the Republican Party picked up, I think, seven seats across the state, uh, across the country. 2014, the Republican Party picks up nine seats. Even in 2018, when the Democratic Party won the House, had numerous victories in the governor level, the Republican Party picked up two seats. So for a national environment significantly better than 2018, what many Republicans see as on par with 2010 and 2014, we can pretty much indicate that 2022 will go to the GOP on the Senate level, or at least so we thought. Taking everything else into consideration, that's what we normally would have expected from our current Senate map. But unfortunately for the GOP, it's a lot trickier than that. Because while we do have many states on the Democratic side that are in this likely column, realistically, Washington isn't going red. Realistically, Colorado isn't going red. And states such as New Hampshire have had such a fiasco with the Republican Party that now it is no longer in true consideration for the national GOP. So that leaves us with three states, and thus three avenues to victories that will likely have to take different forms as we go through our Senate map. It will also be largely contingent on the Republican Party maintaining their keep in all of the red states that are currently highlighted in the likely red characterization. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, two states that went to President Biden in the last election, Ohio, North Carolina, and Florida, all states that went to Obama in 2008, Ohio and Florida in 2012 as well. So states with a not-so-harsh electoral history towards the Democratic Party, but still a harsh one at that. Looking at our map, though, it's not entirely out of the question if a Democrat was to win there, but given our national environment, it would be. So for the sake of this video, we are going to assume, and it's a big assumption, 
we are going to assume the Republican Party maintains their keep in all of these states. But we will explore the possibility that they do not in specifically the state of Pennsylvania, a state where the Democratic Party has roughly an 80 percent chance at victory, according to the deluxe forecast on 538, nearly an 80 percent chance at victory in a battleground state with a Republican incumbent. Quite fascinating, if you ask me. But I'm not putting all my faith into these forecasts. That's why I have it now going to the GOP for the sake of this video. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these states that we want to characterize as potentially the bellwethers, the ones that could not necessarily the bellwethers, but the uh, determining states for who wins the overall majority. In our first scenario, we are going to talk about the state of Nevada. Assuming Democrats hold on to Georgia and Arizona, which honestly would not be too difficult to see, especially the state of Arizona, but more specifically in the state of Nevada, what would have to do in this first scenario in order for the GOP to win? Essentially, the national environment gets slightly better for the Republican Party. And what you find here is that Adam Laxalt, as a stronger GOP nominee than I think many other national Republicans, taps into that and takes advantage of the shift in Latino voters across the state of Nevada. Overall, Latino voters, Hispanic voters, uh, not necessarily as a monolith, but certainly as an overall demographic group, have shifted towards the GOP over the past few years, whether that be special elections in Texas or in between elections across the United States or party registration amongst Hispanic voters or overall presidential shifts from 2020. Point is that minority voters, specifically and especially Hispanic voters, have shifted towards the Republican Party in a way that had not seen previously. So you ask, how did President Biden win? He counteracted that with an even larger shift amongst white voters and suburban voters in favor of the Democratic Party. That's how they counteracted it. States such as Florida saw a shift towards the right. Nevada saw no shift at all. Even though Hispanic voters in the state absolutely did shift towards the GOP, the Democrats walked that back again by counteracting it with white suburban voters. But this would be in an environment where white suburban voters are doing well for the GOP, meaning the Republican Party is returning back to their Mitt Romney type of victories, in addition to the shift amongst minority voters within the state of Nevada. And it honestly isn't too far of a stretch. Realistically speaking, when it comes down to candidate quality, who do you have? Blake Masters in Arizona to compare Adam Laxalt to? Adam Laxalt has won in midterms before. Not necessarily the most impressive margin of victory, but still has won in Nevada in the past. Has name recognition and has electoral experience and is quite literally fulfilling a political dynasty prophecy. Arizona, on the other hand, you have an affluent man like Masters, who has been funded nearly entirely by Peter Thiel, who doesn't exactly come across as this genuine Arizonan, and you can find that to be true in the numbers and the approval rating of Blake Masters. Herschel Walker in the state of Georgia, well, yes, we're in college football season, while well, yes, he's someone who has been long famed in the state itself, he's by no means an experienced and robust politician. I expect as we get closer to the election that he continues to mess up and say things and more scandals come out about him, especially if he is to debate Raphael Warnock on that stage, it will be quite interesting to see what is the result and product of such a debate. But right now, the first uh, priority here for the GOP would likely be through the state of Nevada, because honestly, I don't think Georgia holds out as the most competitive race these midterm elections. And there's a very good chance that we head off into a runoff election in the state of Georgia and the Democrats do exactly what they did in 2021 and they win that race. And consequently, it really wouldn't have mattered. So Nevada is the first opportunity for the GOP, and they, that gives the Republican Party a pathway to the majority. The next one would be, obviously, the next state to turn to, which would be the state of Georgia. And again, this is assuming that the Republican Party is holding on to Wisconsin, holding on to Pennsylvania, holding on to North Carolina, holding on to Ohio. In terms of those chances of victory for the GOP, Wisconsin is 60% for the GOP, Ohio is 72, North Carolina is 63. Pennsylvania, on the other hand, is just 19. Just 19 for the incumbent party. So again, we will talk briefly about counteracting that. That would mean a combination in this circumstance of Georgia and Nevada, which wouldn't be too far out of the question should Democrats win Pennsylvania. But realistically speaking, I don't think that we can say we could count on that either. I think if Pennsylvania is going blue, chances are Nevada and Georgia are as well. Chances are Democrats are winning the Senate majority. But there absolutely is a pathway without Pennsylvania but it isn't the easiest, which is why it's not one of the main three priority pathways, but it is there for consideration and understanding that, yes, it is still possible, but it's going to be very hard to see. And we'll talk about what we mean by that when we explore the chances as certain states go red and blue on the overall outcome in other states. So 
the state of Georgia would be the next state. This would mean Herschel Walker does better than what the polls intend. This means Herschel Walker does better than what many people expect him to do. He is someone who came into this as a celebrity nominee, a non-experienced politician, who quite frankly is underperforming Brian Kemp to a very high extent. Looking at the numbers in the general election here, there is still a very good shot for Herschel Walker, but by no means would I say this is something that I would be confident about if I was a Republican. If I was looking at this from even as a Democrat, I would say, you know, from this perspective, Raphael Warnock still very much has a higher chance of victory than Herschel Walker. But I will also say, Walker could surprise us, and he also has a reasonable shot at victory, according to practically everyone. And I would say that that could be the pathway to the GOP, again, assuming they win everything else. The next one is a bit more extreme. The next one contains the state of Arizona, and this is where it becomes really difficult to see. Because the state of Arizona is a state where Mark Kelly has an 82% chance of victory. Reasonably, Arizona should not have been considered or thrown into this category. However, we have seen a historical underperformance, at least in 2020, for the Democratic Party in the state of Arizona. Historically speaking, the Republican Party is typically overestimated. But right now, what I think, looking at the state of Arizona, there's a possibility that the Democratic Party does lose this state. I don't know to what extent, but there is a possibility that Democrats do lose it. And 18% is a lot more realistic. I think, than actually looking at where we are currently and making some generic estimation. Blake Masters is a Republican in a swing state, but as a candidate himself, does not hold too much more than a 20% chance of victory in the state. But there is a pathway here. And the pathway here would have to rely on Blake Masters doing significantly better and that money that Mitch McConnell is lacking and failing to provide in the state of Arizona comes through from Peter Thiel, comes through from other organizations that will fulfill that gap and boost up Blake Masters to a very good shot at victory because right now he doesn't have it. This is a year no better for the GOP than now for winning the state of Arizona, especially coming after a presidential year where you've lost the state by just 0.3% and has gone to the GOP since 1996. The state of Arizona is entirely within reach for the GOP, and they could get it, but it's not going to be easy, and it's certainly not going to be the first pathway to victory. So as we look on our map, as we treat everything else equally, I want to just briefly show you what happens when we go through these three pathways. The first one would be the state of Georgia. If Republicans are winning Georgia, they have a 55% chance at winning control of the Senate. The chances in Florida become likely are. The chances in North Carolina become likely are. Nevada becomes a toss-up. Ohio becomes likely from lean. Pennsylvania moves down to lean. And Wisconsin becomes lean Republican. The same case is in the state of, uh, let's see here, where is it? The state we were just talking about, the state of Nevada. Should Nevada go red? Pennsylvania, down to lean. Wisconsin, up to lean. North Carolina, up to likely. Georgia, to lean Republican. The 55% chance jumps in there. And when you characterize all of these states that we can pretty much expect to go for both sides of the aisle, we can say Iowa, Indiana, Louisiana going to the GOP realistically, Florida as well, the chance jumps up to 60%. Missouri, we can include there, 60% as well. And then you include potentially other states, and you find Wisconsin becomes likely R, right? Ohio, North Carolina, you include Ohio, what does it jump up to? 68, you include North Carolina, 78, right? And these are states that the GOP is relying on winning and honestly can very much do so. The same is in the case of Georgia, if I was to characterize it in such a fashion. But let's say we take away Georgia. Let's leave it in toss-up, and let's leave Nevada in toss-up as well. Okay, what do we find? Well, we look at the state of Arizona, the other state that we wanted to talk about in terms of a chance at victory for the Republican Party. Well, if we treat Indiana, we treat Iowa again, Louisiana, Missouri, in the same fashion that we have previously. The chances jump up to 32, but it's not super impressive. Florida adding in there jumps it up to 37, but again, Democrats still have the advantage. What's next? We have the state of Arizona. If Arizona was to go to Blake Masters, the chances for the GOP jump up to 80%. Democrats lose Georgia. They lose Nevada. They lose North Carolina. They lose Ohio. And it calls into play Pennsylvania. Again, Nevada, New, sorry, New Hampshire. The state of Wisconsin becomes likely Republican. You see what the impact is, and let's say Democrats do win the state of Pennsylvania. What happens in this circumstance? Because it's being counteracted by Arizona, the Democrats only have a 31% chance of victory. But what if they win the state of Colorado? What if they win the state of Washington? Well, it jumps up to the Democrats being somewhere around 36%, so it seems. Not too impressive. The Democrats would have to win in New Hampshire. On top of that, they would have to win in other states as well to counteract again the loss. 
It would happen if it happens in Nevada. Then the Democrats start to be in the advantage to win. But that's a stretch. Because if Arizona is going red, Nevada probably is too. If Arizona is going red, Georgia probably is too. I can't say the same about the state of Georgia in itself. It would rely on Nevada going as well. But realistically speaking, there are pathways to victory in those three states, Nevada, Georgia, and Arizona, that would give the Republican Party the Senate majority. And it's something that they can't necessarily quote unquote rely on. But it's certainly something to expect, consider, and think about as you move forward into the midterm elections and you consider the viability for the GOP on the Senate level because they still very much have a chance. We just can't say it's the likeliest outcome. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.